Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Karen thinks she's a genius. I give her a reality check. After that, give me a hard time when I'm serving you and your friends? Okay. And after that, am I the jerk for telling my brother I wasn't excited about sister-in-law's pregnancy? Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen gets a reality check. How about I give you a reality check, Reddit boy? So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. Karen thinks she's a genius. I give her a reality check. A friend of mine decided to take advantage of working from home by enrolling in an online class. I thought that was great. And we, her friends, were all of course nothing but supportive. She ended up taking a class that has something to do with how big budget movies are made. She was eager to share what she was learning and it quickly became apparent, based on the kind of things that she was saying, that this was a pretty intro level class. But she was excited and she's already doing one better than me to be furthering her education. So I feigned interest whenever she brought something up, not lying or anything, just the usual polite, oh wow, did you learn that in class? How's that going? Type of back and forth. But she started to get so uppity with the way that she volunteered information where it was no longer her being enthusiastic, but more her delighting in knowing something we didn't know. And it was things we actually all knew, which was the particularly frustrating part. For example, we were all discussing what movies were good to watch this evening, and I suggested a picture because it was set in our hometown. The friend chimed in. Eh, wrong. I just looked it up, and it was actually shot in Louisiana. Movies do that because it's cheaper to shoot there with sets than in the real big name locations. You seriously thought they actually shot them all on location? <laughs> and this is after weeks of similar incidents like this. So that was the final straw for me and I finally said, I know, I said set in, not filmed in. You know a lot of this stuff isn't new information for the average person. I'd think twice before presenting yourself as some film buff when most of us know about everything you've brought up so far. She turned to our friends for support. They tacitly supported me, but mostly opted to stay out of it. After the conversation ended and we had parted ways, I felt badly about it because ultimately she was just trying to share something she was excited about with us and I could have approached the constructive criticism a whole different way. But she was being incredibly condescending repeatedly. Either way, it's driving me mad. Just give it to me straight. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Was OP the jerk or was their friend? Please let us know. When someone's acting like a neckbeard, you treat them like a neckbeard. Not the jerk. Let's move on. Give me a hard time when I'm serving you and your friends? Okay. Years ago, I worked at a busy corporate sit-down burger restaurant. One day, I'm hustling through the lunch rush and I have six college guys sit down. One flags me over and loudly pronounces that they're ready to order right away. What are you guys having? I ask. Guys? The same guy says with a smirk on his face. Guys? That doesn't sound like a very professional greeting to me. I work at a restaurant too. And if I walked up to a table and asked, what are you guys having? My manager would definitely let me know that was inappropriate. The other guys at the table look kind of uncomfortable at this exchange and just silently sit there. The main guy looks around at all of them and keeps going. Why don't you come up to us again and do it right? At this point, I'm looking around at my massive section of tables and getting the distinct feeling I'm going to be at this table forever. I'm trying not to lose my cool, so I smile. Sure, I say. Take several steps back and walk up again. Gentlemen, how are you all doing? Ready to order? The main guy smirks and nods. I look directly at him. How about you, chief? What are you having today? Some of the other guys laugh. He looks angrily at me, but orders his burger and a drink. I get everyone's order and hustle off. I return with drinks a little while later. I set everyone's drinks down and do the main guy last. Here you go, boss. I leave before he can say anything. Through the course of their meal, I call him a bunch of different nicknames every time. You need a refill, pal? How's your burger, buddy? Need more ketchup, bro? Can I get that plate out of your way, dude? Any dessert for you, amigo? Need me to split your check, brother? Make sure to leave me one signed copy, muchacho. So by this time, this guy is boiling. His friends are loving it though. As time has gone on, the rest of them keep looking at me expectantly. What nickname next? Finally, they all get up to leave. 
Lunch rush has ended and I'm chilling at this point. I casually walk up to them. Thank you gentlemen for coming in. The rest of the group is smiling. I look at the main guy. And you, have a fantastic day, hoss. The rest of the guys cheer. They all head out. I grab all their receipts on the table. Surprise, surprise, the main guy left me zero for a tip. I didn't care. It was all worth it. Am I the jerk for telling my brother I wasn't excited about sister-in-law's pregnancy? My brother Matt and his wife Lucy have six sons. Their youngest, John, is two and was born with a chromosomal abnormality. It's so rare that the doctors aren't entirely sure how this will affect him in the future. Currently, his development is much slower than other kids. Matt and Lucy have been taking him to all sorts of specialists, a speech therapist, and a physical therapist. Their insurance covers some, but not all of this, and the out-of-pocket fees can get pretty hefty. From what I know of their finances, they're not struggling, but they also don't have much to spare. Three months ago, Lucy announced that they were expecting another kid and made it clear that this wouldn't necessarily be their last. I was immediately concerned, but tried to ignore it and be excited and supportive. I congratulated them, was super enthusiastic at their gender reveal. Basically, I did my best to hide how I felt, but it didn't work. Matt approached me and my boyfriend at a family gathering to ask what was wrong and why I seemed more thrilled about our sister's puppy than his wife's pregnancy. I tried to play it off like it was nothing and I just had a lot on my plate, but he was insistent. My boyfriend tried to deflect by joking that I had run out of ways to show my excitement the seventh time around and boy, did Matt not like that. I decided to just come clean and tell Matt that I knew I had no right to tell him how many kids he could have and that I would love my new nephew just as much as the rest of my nephews, but I assumed he would stop having kids after John so that they could focus as much time and resources on him as possible. He was upset and said that just because John has a special need doesn't mean other kids will. I explained to him that I was more worried about them having enough money to afford the best possible doctors and therapists for John and enough time and energy to advocate for him and help him. He said they always wanted a big family and John doesn't change that and they can always get the older kids to look after the younger ones when something with John comes up. I said six kids already is a big family and it was unfair to expect that of his older kids. He blew up and told me I had no idea what I was talking about because I don't have kids, and I probably won't since I overthink so much. I would talk myself out of having them for even the smallest of risks. And when you have kids, you just make it work. I told him I don't think assuming he could just make it work was a good idea. And I was sorry, but I couldn't force myself to be excited when he hadn't said anything to ease my concerns, and that maybe I was a bit more excited about our sister's new puppy because she triple checked that she had the finances, time, and appropriate environment before adopting. He grabbed Lucy and stormed off, and I haven't heard from them since. I texted an apology because they won't take my calls. Edit. Thank you all so much for weighing in. I really do appreciate it. I've seen and read some comments saying I think John is a burden slash unloved, and I was basically telling him to not have the baby. I just wanted to say that that is not the case at all. I adore John. He's my godson and such a smiley, sweet blessing of a baby, and I'm sure I'll feel the same about my new nephew. My concern is coming from the fact that we have no idea what John's future will look like. Some people with this condition are adults who are living independently, while others require care for the rest of their lives. Just because John has needs that their other kids don't doesn't make him a burden. Burden implies that we're not happy to give John everything he might need or want, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her brother? Please let us know. Sometimes people get so caught up in the idea of wanting to have a bunch of kids that common sense goes out the window. The Karen with the white Audi. This happened about four years ago now, before Karens were called Karens, but the type still existed. I'm an electromechanical engineer and had been called out to deal with a set of faulty automatic gates. They had stuck in the open position and it was compromising the security of the building. My job was to find out what it caused them to stick open, fix it, and get them working again. This particular manufacturer of gates uses an encoder to tell the control panel where the gates are in their swing, and it turned out kids had been riding on the gates and it caused this to go out of calibration. Recalibration was a simple two-minute job. I had put a couple of traffic cones on each side of the gates and set the calibration going. During this process, the gates open fully and then close fully twice at about half the usual speed, 
around 120 seconds. Enter entitled Karen. She had parked her white Audi in the secure compound whilst the gates were open, and even though she was only allowed in there to load and unload into her shop, she regularly parked all day in a visitor space, totally against the terms of her lease. So I set the calibration going and the gates did their first swing totally open, at which point Karen came out to her car and started her engine. The gate started to close again and Karen pulled out of her space like a nut job and accelerated towards the gates, stopping just before the cones but revving her engine like she wasn't pleased. Seeing them closing, she pressed her fob button to get them to open, but of course they were calibrating so they were totally ignoring all instructions from her fobs. The gates closed fully. The lock mechanism engaged and they started to do their second swing, at which point she started to roll forwards, revving all the time. Just as she touched the cone with her car, she pushed it back and broke the infrared safety beam, thus aborting the entire procedure and making the gates lock in a slightly open state. She sounded her horn and shouted at me, demanding to be let out. I told her she had caused the processor to fault and those gates weren't opening anytime soon. It would be at least five minutes before I could restart the procedure and I had to power them totally down. I didn't, but she didn't know. She proceeded to start shouting and getting angry. So I just said, sod you. I'm parked outside. I locked the control box, walked to my van with my tools in my pocket and started driving away. About two minutes later, I got a call from the landlord of the building pleading with me to go back and saying that Karen was really, really sorry. I gave in, I went back and I started the calibration again. But this time, I deliberately turned the speed on both motors to the lowest setting, so it took about 10 minutes in total. Karen never did apologize, and she still sped out like an idiot as soon as I moved the cones, but it gave me great pleasure knowing that my malice made her almost half an hour late. Am I the jerk for refusing to pay my sister's rent to my parents? This probably could do with some context and backstory, so here we go. I, 19, male, have a stepsister, 18, female. For clarity, my bio parents got divorced when I was very young, so I never knew my real dad, and my stepsister is my stepdad's daughter from a previous marriage. I've always known my stepsister was the favorite with my parents. Just little things, like when I was young and had birthdays, she always had to have presents and a fair share of the attention, while the reverse was never the case on her birthday. When I was 14, I got a paper round to earn a bit of pocket money. My parents forced me to give my sister half of that money. The same was true when I was 16 and I got a Saturday job at Burger King. Using my share of my pay that I saved up and bought myself a laptop to do schoolwork on. When my stepdad found out, he made me share that with my stepsister too. True to form, she managed to delete all of my schoolwork, including my A-level coursework. Then when I confronted her about it, she smashed the laptop on the floor. By this point, I had also turned 18 and my parents decided that since I was 18 and working, I needed to pay rent, which I did for about six months before I decided to move into a flat shared with some friends. So partially because of the aforementioned laptop incident, I missed out on the grades I needed to go to my chosen uni. So I'm having to retake a couple of subjects while working full time. That's okay, I can manage that now that I'm out of the madhouse. But last weekend, I got a phone call from mom. She and stepdad have decided that since they started charging me rent when I turned 18 and stepsister has just turned 18, it's only fair that they charge her rent too. The kicker? Because she hasn't got a job, has never had a job and isn't even looking for one, they think that it would be a nice and brotherly thing for me to help her pay, i.e. pay them rent on her behalf. I told them no, since I don't see why I should be responsible for yet more expenses on her behalf. Plus, I'm already paying my own rent, utilities, and council tax. I don't have a huge amount of spare money to afford that. Things didn't get nasty or heated on the phone at that time, but now I have uncles, aunts, cousins, grandparents, etc. blowing up my phone and my Facebook, calling me a horrible son and ungrateful for not stepping up to help out. So, am I the jerk here? Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his parents? Please let us know. I would cut each and every one of those folks out of your life. This one really breaks my heart. Am I the jerk for calling the cops on my neighbor's kids? I heard kids playing on my porch, so I told my kids to get their socks and shoes on because it sounded like their friends were outside playing already. My daughter opens the door and two very small kids jump off of my porch and they start running towards the road, which made me nervous right off the bat because they were so small. 
about three and four. But they stopped and came back when they saw it was just my kids, and I realized that these were two kids that I had not seen before at all in the neighborhood, and there was no adult inside supervising them. I tried to ask them where they lived, where their grown-up was, and if I could walk them home, but the boy kept yelling at me that he knows where he lives, at the mountain. This doesn't make sense. We live two hours away from the closest mountain, but he's also around three. So I called the non-emergency police line and explained the situation. Two cops showed up about 20 minutes later and found the mom about 10 houses down. She kept glaring at me as the cop was talking to her. When they left, she meekly starts calling her kids who are just straight up ignoring her. And I said, I don't think that's going to work. I think you need to come get them. She glared at me again and took 10 minutes to wrangle up her kids and go home. I'm not sure if this paragraph is going to add any context or if it's just going to make me feel better to type it out because it was weird. But here goes. The girl wouldn't talk to me at all, probably shy, but the boy was weirdly demanding and disrespectful, even for a three-year-old. He told me to get him water, and I did, which he screamed at me for not bringing him a big bottle of water. Then at one point, when I was waiting for the cops, he told me that he was going in my house to get more toys to bring out, and I told him, no you're not, and he straight up looked me in the eye and said, yes I am, and was going to just walk in my house. I don't know if this is just offhanded weirdness or if maybe these kids are allowed to do whatever they want in their house. It honestly just kind of floored me because my kids would never talk to me that way, let alone a strange adult. He also told the cop that he ran away because he felt like it. Anyway, when I told my best friend and mom, they agreed with what I did. But when I told my boyfriend, he brought up that the lady might have been glaring at me because they might not be fully legal here and I may have put them on blast. I'm definitely not trying to get anyone deported, but I'm also not trying to babysit two small kids that I don't know for free all day. So, was I the jerk here? Update. Thank you everyone for your advice and awards. I didn't expect to gain any traction, and I took my kids on a nice forest walk and came back to a bunch of comments. After my boyfriend got home, we talked about it more, and after reading a lot of your comments, my boyfriend said that he didn't think I was in the wrong to call, he just thought that could have been the reason why she was glaring. He's glad I took care of the kids. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or is their neighbor? Please let us know. A three and a four year old running around the neighborhood by themselves? Parent of the year right here. Lady has to walk to her car for her ID and has a fit. Rude lady came in and asked for a $1,000 money order. The system comes up with the screen for me to scan her ID because any money order that is over $1,000 or more requires an ID. So I asked the lady for her ID. Since when do I need an ID for the money order? Me. Well, since the money order is for $1,000, our system requires we have your ID in order to proceed with the transaction. But my ID is in the car. Well, I can't continue the transaction without your ID. But my picture is on my debit card. I'm sorry, ma'am, but that doesn't count. I have to have an actual ID. Well, we can just do two separate money orders for $500 each me. No ma'am, we can't do that either. Our store policy states that all money orders for the same person must be done on a single transaction, so I would still need your ID. Rude lady storms off. I go back to the service desk and help get the line down over there when rude lady comes in and asks my manager what the most she can get on a money order is without her ID and my manager tells her $999. Someone else needed a money order, so I headed back to the money center to help them and Rude Lady follows shortly behind. I finish up with the other customer, and Rude Lady comes back to the counter. I need a money order for $1,000. Okay, can I see your ID? Here! She slams her ID on the counter. I can't believe you made me walk all the way out to my car over $1. Me. I'm sorry, ma'am. That's just the policy. Rude Lady continues talking about me to herself. I just ignore her and finish up the money order. Me. All right, there you go. Thank you and have a great night. Rude lady starts to walk off, but decides to be a complete jerk instead. She slammed the money order on the counter and began yelling at me. Put it in my hand. Put it in my hand since you want to sit there and treat me like a dog. What? I just decided it would be best to ignore her and keep walking back to the service desk. Wrong. That's right. Walk away, you nasty jerk. Me. Excuse me? Let me go grab my manager real quick. Rude lady ran out of the store before I could make it around the corner to my manager. 
I went and told my manager and she tried to chase her down because she's not afraid of getting fired for talking back to a customer and she doesn't let anyone treat her employees like that. Unfortunately, she didn't catch her. All of that over having to walk out to your car in the parking lot because you didn't have your ID. I will never understand people. Yes, I want a coffee without any coffee. Years ago, I worked for the big Canadian coffee and donut shop, mostly working the evening shift. If you aren't familiar with Canadian brand coffee shop, the cream and sugar are dispensed by a machine that is calibrated to the amount determined by corporate. If you're used to ordering at the fancy green place or the running donut place, the number of sugar and creams you order may need to change depending on how much you actually want. One night, we had these three bikers drive in, and you could tell they had been on the road for a while. Their ringleader was your stereotypical biker. Tall, wide shoulders, big beard, covered in leather. His friends there were shorter, but otherwise still had the whole tough but tired look going on. My coworker was in the back working soup and kitchen, but it's only three people and it's been a slow night. No worries, just need to get these tired boys some caffeine and wish them a good night. Ringleader. I want an extra large 12 and 12. Me. Are you sure? Did I stutter? Me. Okay. But that's only his friend. Did he stutter? N no. N no, he did not. So off I went to make him exactly what he asked for. Grabbed a cup and put it under the sugar dispenser while I pressed the times three button four times. 12 XL shots of sugar. Then I went over to the cream dispenser and did the same thing. Now, fun fact. The cream and sugars are measured to dispense one twelfth of the cup size you are selecting. So by the time all 12 shots of creamer were dispensed, the cup was basically full. I stirred the creamy sugar mixture around before I poured an itty bitty splash of coffee in his cup, just enough to bring it up to the safety line of the cup. I tried asking him if he wanted me to heat it up or anything, but I basically got the exact runaround from him and his friend. Obviously, the guy knew what he wanted and he didn't need me to tell him what he was ordering. They grabbed the rest of their order and drove out into the night. Now, you would think that was the end of the story. The big angry biker man got his nasty sugar cream drink and left me sitting there wondering if the rest of the world had been drinking their coffee wrong this entire time. But no, I was lucky enough to be working the next afternoon when he came back in. Mr. Ringleader came back in all by himself the next day and shuffled up to the counter. I could tell he must have been embarrassed because his voice was a lot softer this time. He knew he messed up. The glorious aftermath is that he apologized and confirmed that the drink had been utterly disgusting. Turns out he was used to ordering from the fancy green coffee place and they use way smaller measurements for their cream and sugar. Once I knew where he was used to ordering from, I made him the approximately same drink using our measurements, roughly a triple triple, and sent him on his way. I only wish I could have seen his face when he took that first sip. Am I the jerk for not giving my dad and his new family access to my vacation home? I'm 34, and my wife and I bought a vacation home in a resort town in Florida a few years ago. The real estate market is ridiculous right now, and we just saw our neighbor there's house sell for double what they paid for it three years ago. We don't have plans to sell too anytime soon, but we're not totally eliminating the possibility either. We aren't there full time, so we've let my brother and some of my friends and their significant others without kids stay there from time to time so they can have a cheap vacation. My dad remarried a woman a lot younger than him last year and she has two boys ages 12 and 10. I've only met them a couple of times and while they were nice, they're extremely high energy and always running around all over the place. My dad asked if he and his new wife could take the kids there for a week while we aren't there and after thinking about it, my wife and I decided against it. We love how nice it is and don't want kids there possibly ruining anything. So we told him if he can get a babysitter and wants to take the wife, that's fine, but we're keeping the place child free as a safety precaution to keep it in good shape. He was really mad and kept accusing me of not accepting our new family. I'm sorry, but I don't view those kids as family despite that they're technically my stepbrothers, given I was over 30 when he married her. He's still mad and his new wife, who I've never had a strong opinion about, called me pleading too, saying how the boys could really use a vacation and how it could be a great way to build a relationship with them too. I told her sorry, but it was a joint decision between me and my wife and that's final. This morning I woke up to another long text from her and I'm annoyed, but also figured I'd get some other perspectives on if I'm being unreasonable because my brother thinks I should give them a trial run, but essentially said at the end of the day it's my call, but that he would. Edit. 
The no kids rule is applied to anyone who stayed there. Currently, we've only let my brother and three of our good couple friends stay there. It's not a place we're advertising to all of our friends or relatives. Well, who do you agree with? OP or his dad? Please let us know. Your property, your decision. Tell your dad to buzz off. I recruited an unwitting army to annoy a jerk. Back in the early 90s, my friend, I'll call him Lou because that's his name, was selling his RX-7 via an ad in the old print auto trader. It came out every Thursday, so that first weekend was critical for sales. The very first guy that came to see it on Saturday said he wanted to buy it after driving it. Of course, he had to finance, so they couldn't finish the sale during the weekend. Lou was worried about losing all the bites from the new ad, so he asked for a deposit of $500. The guy wrote a check. Lou told the rest of the callers that weekend that it was sold and, unfortunately, didn't ask for their numbers in case it fell through. This story predates caller ID availability in my area by a couple of years, so these leads were gone. As you surely expect by now, the guy flakes on Monday and Lou deposits the check. Payment stopped. Big surprise. Sitting around my apartment, we schemed revenge, but all we had to go on was the check. Lucky for karma, there was a phone number printed on it. Our first idea was to write a little program to dial his number repeatedly from my modem, but that would be easily stopped and probably get us in direct trouble. Then Lou got a page from his work. This was back in the one-way pager days. You call the pager's dedicated phone number, it sounds a tone, then you punch digits for the number you want to be sent to the pager. The person with the pager receives the number you entered and presumably calls it. Everyone with a pager made sure that people who needed to get a hold of them had the number for their pager. You'd see pager numbers in print and TV ads all the time for various services. Boom! Angelic choir sings. Heavenly light goes off. Lou's pager number and my pager number had the same prefix, middle three digits. What if we randomly dial numbers with that prefix and page them all to this guy's number? So we order a pizza, open some beers, and start looking through the yellow pages at locksmiths and tow truck services to find more pager prefixes. We wind up with a dozen or so. After that, it's half an hour of coding in ye olde Borland C++. I put together a program that would cycle through our list of known prefixes and add a random final four digits to get a random pager. It calls the pager's number, pauses, then dials this jerk's number and throws a 911 suffix on there for good measure which is something people with pagers understand to indicate an emergency of some kind. The whole thing was just generating different strings of numbers with different pager prefixes. The commas made pauses since you'd need to connect to the paging service before you can enter the message. Make string, send a modem, wait for no carrier, hang up, repeat. We start eating the pizza and let it fly. I was very picky about my devices, so my modem was a US robotics courier. You could set an S register to control how long it would sound each tone when dialing. Uber nerds like myself would keep tinkering with that to get as fast as possible while still being recognized by the phone service. It was very fast. It could run through four pages per minute. So this guy would get 240 calls an hour. We just watched it run and laughed our butts off. We realized pretty early on that we didn't really know if it was working. So we wandered down to the 7-Eleven and called him from a payphone just in case he could somehow trace it or the popo were on the case and watching. A man answered and I said, Hello, I got a page at this number. I heard an audible sigh and then he just hung up. Gold. We ended up running it for a few hours, then let it go quiet for a few days. Then we scheduled it to start dialing the middle of the night every few nights. Plus, we'd fire it up by hand randomly whenever we had a party. We checked again from the 7-Eleven after a week and it went to an answering machine which did the rapid tone at the end of the greeting to indicate the tape was full. We reasoned that the line was still ringing anyway, so we kept at it for another month or so. Eventually, we got the disconnected warning when we made one of our regular checkups. I'm sure he just changed the number. I like to think about that guy answering the phone after a few days of silence when we started it up. I can vividly imagine his response at the, did someone page me to this number? As he slams the phone down, and then it rings again a few seconds later. Or, of course, coming home from work and having an answering machine full of random people asking about being paged. And yeah, we annoyed several thousand people into calling this guy by the end, but each of those people was only put out for a single call. A cost, yes, but a necessary one for justice. Have you ever heard of a pager before this story? Or did you have no clue what it was? 
please let us know. Oh, I bet none of them knew. Whether or not they'll admit it in the comments is another question. You won't believe what happens in this video. So please come watch it next and we'll see you when you get there. And huge shout out to our newest official channel member, Taz. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. It really means the world to us. Join as a channel member today and we'll give you a special shout out in our next video. And to have us make any kind of video you'd like us to, head over to our Fiverr. Link pinned in the comments below.